because Skip, because of Skip's vast experience and expertise on the topic, he landed on the panel as well. Our goal this afternoon is to have a stimulating and constructive dialogue on industrial energy use and efficiency and solutions for achieving complementary environmental and economic outcomes. Our speakers will have about 17 to 20 minutes to speak. We will wait until their, their presentations are over before we open the floor for uh, questions and answers. So let's get on with it. Our first speaker is Skip Leitner. Skip is a senior fellow and former director of economic and social analysis for the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. He now leads a team of consultants, the Economic and Human Dimensions Research Associates, based in Tucson, Arizona. He previously served almost 10 years as a senior economist for technology policy with the US EPA. He left the Federal Service in June of 2006 to focus his research on developing a more robust technology and behavioral characterization of energy efficiency resources for use in energy and climate policy analyses and within economic policy models. In 1988, 1998, Skip was awarded EPA's gold medal for his work with a team of economists to evaluate the impact of different strategies that might assist in the implementation of smart climate policies. In 2003, the U.S. Combined Heat and Power Association gave him an award to acknowledge his contributions to the policy development of that industry. In 2004, his paper, How Far Energy Efficiency Catalyzed New Research into the Proper Characterization of Efficiency as a Long-Term Resource. Skip has more than 40 years of involvement in the environmental, energy, and economic policy arenas. His most immediate research focuses on two areas. The first, building on the work of Robert Ayers and Benjamin War, examines the links between energy and inefficiency and a productive economy. The second area explores the larger energy efficiency and economic productivity benefits of information and communication technologies. Among Skip's recent publications is a report for which he was the lead author in January of 2012. The Long-Term Energy Efficiency Potential, What the Evidence Suggests. Among the key findings in that report is that the U.S. has the capacity to reduce the nation's long-term energy needs by about one half and still maintain a robust economy. Ladies and gentlemen, Skip Leitner. Thank you, Leo. In fact, the short time I have with you this afternoon, I'm going to draw on two of the references Leo mentioned, both the uh, work I've been doing with Bob Ayers, and some of you may know him, he's a, actually a physicist economist, uh, working a lot in the world of ecological economics and uh, uh, industrial ecology, but also the 2012 study that we did with my colleagues, pointing out the opportunities for energy efficiency, and I want to link the two of them, hopefully in a, in a useful way. We have a clicker that won't click. Okay, okay well, very good. So I'm going to begin with uh, a look at my favorite American philosopher, Gary Larson. And the idea here is that small differences in assumptions can lead to very big differences in outcomes. So we've got a dog in the back seat of his master's car looking at his friend in the front yard. He says, ha, 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 Biff, guess what? After we go to the drugstore and the post office, I'm going to vets to get tutored. <laughs> Small assumptions can have very big differences in outcomes. And with that, I also suggest sometimes we may actually need to reinvent the wheel. And here I'm drawing on uh, 1970 work by teenager, then teenager, Frank Nasmer, the outside of uh, Washington, D.C. area. He actually did reinvent the wheel and it popularized inline skating. At the same time, energy service companies since 1970 have developed new business models that have expanded, for example, the deployment of CHP systems and many other technologies. And one I want to talk a minute quickly to introduce the Raspberry Pi, which I think has the potential to redirect and transform energy efficiency in some surprising new ways. And so the question, what is the Raspberry Pi? 
Turns out some years ago, the University of Cambridge in the UK noticed that many PhD students applying for degrees in computer science had never actually mucked with a computer. They'd never gotten their hands in it. They never played with the wire and the chips. They never got inside and played with all the gizzardry inside. And they thought that was unusual for computer science uh, PhDs. And the answer, the question was why? Because it costs a lot. Even a thousand dollar computer, not something you want to mess with. So they got together with colleagues from ARM. ARM is the uh, microchip design firm. You may never have heard of them out of the UK, but over 90% of all cell phones use their chip design to maintain the work we do with cell phones now. With that in mind, they designed what's now called the Raspberry Pi. And this is my own Raspberry Pi in my own hand. It's a credit card sized computer that can be plugged into your TV and keyboard, be used for many of the same things. In many ways, it's more powerful than current desktop computers. It does things like word processing and spreadsheet sorts of manipulations. The interesting thing is I paid $54 for this on Amazon.com. And I'm beginning to ask the question, what might that reduction in cost and size, increased performance, mean for prospective efficiency improvements and how we might model such things? It's those kinds of questions we're beginning to wrestle with here. With that as a backdrop, the innovative technology begin to emerge. I want to present actually now, building on the work of my colleague Bob Ayers, two views of energy. First of all, as we're more familiar with it, energy as tracked by the Energy Information Administration, which I refer to as energy as commodity, kilowatt hours, gallons of gasoline, barrels of oil, tons, and the like. That's one way to view energy that we talk about here today. But I also want to introduce energy as the capacity to do useful work, an entirely different approach. How we use energy to transform matter into the goods and services we desire, what it takes to get that done, what it takes to put those goods and services where people need them at the time they need them. And to ensure the appropriate development of innovation that ensures a uh, sustainable economic activity, I'm suggesting the emphasis needs to be on energy as work, not energy as commodity. So two definitions. When we talk about energy, even the US Association of Energy Economics, when they mention the word energy, you're really talking about this word we call exergy. That is to say, the availability of high quality energy, high quality above the level of ambient pressures, temperatures in the environment, to actually accomplish a physical momentum transformation of goods and services. In fact, energy equals exergy, the high quality available energy. We think of gasoline as a form of exergy, for example. And energy, a, for, a term we most probably not familiar with, but that's the useless energy. Energy equals exergy plus energy, and energy is constant. So we're talking about the entropic process of moving from high quality exergy to useless energy, all staying constant, and we need to be focusing on this thing we call exergy. Citing a colleague, Reiner Kummel from Germany, who's done an interesting book in this way. But Bob and I would talk about work as exergy times the efficiency. That is to say, what is the minimum amount of energy, or exergy in this case, needed to accomplish a given task, and how efficiently we're applying that. That will make a big difference in the way we view what we can accomplish with exergy as work. Or as my colleagues from, the, from Germany have done, in the US, we find 86% of energy is wasted. In other words, we have 14% of the exergy, the high quality energy, supporting the 86% waste. And you can imagine that tends to hold back, I think, a robust economy. So let me ask this question. What's wrong with this particular picture? The usual Sankey diagram we have in the case of not 2011, the US using 97 quads. And then we have the idea of about uh, 50 some percent of that being wasted, rejected primarily through thermal emissions in power plant electricity generation. We say, therefore, we're 43% efficient. And I'm suggesting, really, we need to read the fine print. Down here in the fine print, we find that the assumption is that industry buildings are 86%, 8% efficient, which is entirely wrong, and that transportation is 25% efficient, which is entirely wrong as well. When we begin to add up the totals in a different way, we find that what is really useful energy is a subset, a very small subset of that larger amount of energy we track, the 97 quads, so that what we're really talking about as an economy is more like 14% energy efficient. And this has huge implications for both productivity and costs across the economy. Jumping to the end of the story then, 2012 study my colleagues and I did with ACEEE, the long-term energy efficiency potential, what the evidence suggests, if we take a step back 
and look at the fundamental elements of how energy is at work in the economy, we found that we can imagine a cost-effective reduction of energy, 40 to 60 percent, roughly half that Leah referred to, of investments that could generate uh, 2 million jobs and provide residential consumers and businesses with a net in the U.S. of $400 billion a year, the equivalent of about $2,600 per household, if spread out across all households. If the industrial business parts, the government parts, were attributed to households, about $2,600 a year. But that takes a stepping back to reimagine how energy might be put to work and how it might be usefully employed in ways that increase overall productivity. So the insight, we're suggesting that instead of tiny increments, the U.S. will be better off thinking big about energy productivity and energy services, rather than relying on the usual set of costs and conventional energy resources. I liken it to the iceberg. We now have an economy that I suggest is more by waste than ingenuity, the anemic 14% of converting exergy into useful work, or we conventionally call it 14% energy inefficiency. And with that as a backdrop, holding back our thinking, we tend to imagine the efficiency potential as above the top of the surface of the water. But in fact, we're beginning to find that there are indeed larger and larger opportunities moving away from simple devices to infrastructure and systems efficiency improvements, the equivalent in the U.S. of a 250 billion barrel of oil throughout uh, the economy through the year 2050, should we choose to mine and invest in those technologies. Step, taking a step back to look at this from an economic perspective, recalling the words of physicist John Wheeler, emeritus professor at Princeton who died a couple of years ago. Uh, he should have won the Nobel, he never did. You probably know him best by the phrase black hole, one of the ideas that he coined. He commented back then, we shape the world by the questions we ask. And so I'm beginning to apply a little bit different take on this and look at how the U.S. has actually converted exergy that is to say, the useful, high-quality energy available to accomplish work in the economy and what that might look like over time. So we have 1950. If we look at the numbers the way Bob and his colleague Benjamin Warr have laid it out for us, we converted 8% of all the exergy thrown at the economic problem. And we did improve a 4% increase from 1950 to 1980 from 8% to 12%. But here's the rub. Instead of looking at the conventional energy intensity, we're beginning to look at the exergy efficiency, and we have a lagging improvement in how we convert exergy into work. And we're beginning to suggest that that is among the reasons for a slumping economy. It's holding back the robustness of the U.S. economy. Or to look at it differently, emerging insights into the critical world of what we call used energy or a conversion of exergy into work to enhance productivity. And here I've plotted useful work per labor hour. In 1950, the amount of useful work, not total energy, but the amount of work actually done in the form of energy applied by labor in 1950, and set that as an index to 100, and looked at how that migrated upward in a very positive way through about 1980. And here we saw improvement in exergy efficiency of just under 1.5% a year. And economy-wide productivity, in effect, uh, per capita GDP, grew at about 2 and a quarter percent a year in the period 1950 to 1980. But as we saw in the previous chart and seen here in a different way, the amount of useful work per labor hour, we could do the same thing for capital, uh, but per labor hour here, the exergy efficiency slumped almost a full percent from 1.45 to actually a bit more than 1% to 0.42% a year. And the economy-wide productivity declined by about a half a percent a year. In other words, the ability for labor or capital to be animated by exergy efficiency, by useful work, has slumped. And we've seen that in the trends of the economy over this period of time. So the question is, how might we find and regain a robust economy no longer replying, uh, uh, relying on business as usual, but scaling to the level of an energy efficiency revolution. So I'm going to offer just three quick examples. We could go into many, many more if we're really willing to look. And imagining industry in this case is more a source of multiple innovations than as a mere consumer of energy. One example, one of my favorite, optimizing our nation's traffic signals. There are an estimated 272,000 traffic signal systems in the U.S. today. 
stop and start driving poorly timed signals cause unnecessary fuel consumption on our nation's highways. Retrofitting these systems with smart sensors and dynamic programming techniques, we suggest, uh, actually uh, colleagues from the National Transportation uh, Engineering Committee, that we could improve traffic flow in such a way as to reduce on highway fuel consumption 5 to 10% a year just by introducing IT type technologies, information type technologies. The cost across the economy about 10 to 12 dollars per household, the savings $150 per household or more a year, a couple tanks of gas by avoiding that kind of stop and start driving idling unnecessarily. That's one example. But we might then be thinking about developing what we call intelligent efficiency. This is not yesterday's idea of a compact fluorescent, but really interconnected systems that can reduce energy use by one-fourth of today's levels while still maintaining jobs in a robust economy. And that's not just me talking, but our colleagues at Schneider Electric and Rockwell Automation. With new information technologies, advanced sensors and, cons and controls, they are offering services to manufacturing firms that can reduce electricity use by up to 40%. They're making a living on this and reducing oil and gas requirements by up to 35%. That's the second category. But the third is also interesting to me. A 2007 study by the Department of Energy done by the National Renewable Energy Lab suggested that if all commercial buildings were rebuilt, taking the entire building stock and refashioning over time using known comprehensive packages of efficiency and technologies, we could reduce their typical use by up to 60%. Adding widespread installation of rooftop PV photovoltaic power systems could lead to an average of not 60%, but up to 88% reduction in the use of conventional energy resources. Cost-effective technologies as feedback and intelligent infrastructure all help to amplify those kinds of savings. So with that as a backdrop, understanding energy as the ability to accomplish useful work in the economic arena, and then a number of technologies in ways that we conventionally don't think of efficiency improvements, these concluding thoughts. At the behest of actually Michael Keynes, who was one of my reviewers on this, and he, I don't see eye to eye entirely, but he's been extremely helpful to me to think out this possibility. What is the role of prices? And I thought this might be an interesting way to look at it. So I'm taking here the role of prices from 1957, actually energy costs, not prices, but energy costs from 1957 over time, melding it with a Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, energy commodity price survey, cost survey, with the U.S. actual energy expenditure. So I'm doing a melding and hybrid of this index over time. We can see uh, that as it compares to GDP, what we call useful work, the amount of work actually in the form of useful energy expended to achieve an outcome, and then the role of exergy efficiency, that we can see that the prices and costs have jumped quite a bit but there doesn't seem to be a relationship necessarily. There is one, one can imagine, as it affects GDP. And certainly the trend of, of uh, what we call useful work is unaffected largely by this. And exergy efficiency has been almost, one might imagine, um, uh, without any influences directly from either price or, as I've tried to show here, major policy initiatives. So the conclusion we might draw from this a huge amount of opportunity, but our current system of policies and prices may not be directed at useful work, simply a supply side perspective rather than a large scale energy productivity perspective. And if we want prices and policies to work, we may need to redirect that orientation to drive actual changes in exergy efficiency and the useful work that drives the productivity of the economy ahead. On the other hand, getting prices and policies aligned in ways to promote useful work. Again, Gary Lars, a couple of spiders on a child's playground, woven a web across the bottom of the slide. If we pull this off, we'll live like kings. Or as my uh, German artist friends paraphrasing Maynard Keynes, the difficulty is to escape the old ideas. And with that, thank you very much. Look forward to some questions. Karen Mathias. Karen is the managing consultant for the Council of Alaska Producers, a statewide nonprofit trade association representing Alaska's large metal mines and advanced development projects. Karen advocates on behalf of the industry, in particular its positive economic impacts in Alaska. Prior to starting her consulting company in Anchorage in 2010, Karen was a Canadian diplomat for 16 years. 
After assignments in Ottawa and Eastern Europe, she came to Anchorage in 2004 to open Canada's first consulate in Alaska. Karen serves as the boards on the boards of the Alaska State Chamber of Commerce, the Resource Development Council, and the Institute of the North. In 2008, she was named one of Alaska's top 40 under 40. Karen? Thanks very much, Leah. So we're going to move from high-level, kind of national focus of Skip's talk to local impact of uh, energy issues and industry. Um, I see a few familiar faces in the room, but I think quite a few of you are uh, not from Alaska. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, would you put up your hand if you're from out of state? Okay, that, that's helpful for me. Congratulations on visiting Alaska. You picked the, the best summer in, I'm sure you've heard, the last 10 years to come here. So uh, I hope you're enjoying your visit. Uh, the reason um, that I asked uh, uh, where you're from is that uh, for a lot of people, um, mining uh, is, uh, is not a very familiar topic. And I'd like to start by just talking a little bit about why we need mining in the first place. And you know, there's a lot of misperceptions out there. And uh, I hope that uh, you might actually be surprised to hear about some of the advanced technologies used in the mining sector, uh, the reliance on highly skilled workers, and, and also the importance of mining to the green economy. Uh, then I want to emphasize that mining can be done right, and it is being done right here in Alaska, where we have one of the world's most stringent regulatory systems. Finally, I'll give an overview of mining in Alaska and talk a little bit about the energy uses and, and its challenges and how the companies are trying to deal with some of those challenges. So the reason I like to start by talking a little bit about why we need mining in the first place is that some of you might be like me. Uh, before I came to Alaska about 10 years ago, I wasn't from the mining industry. I really didn't spend a lot of time thinking about where things come from. Uh, to be honest, I probably couldn't have told you a single use for zinc. I'd never even heard of molybdenum, let alone could pronounce it. So it's, uh, I don't think that uncommon. Um, I'm not proud of that fact, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fairly prevalent, especially for people who live in cities. Our modern lives are just so far removed from the resources that we depend on. But if you really think about it, we're using minerals and metals in every aspect of our daily lives, from our computers and our iPhones to just about every form of transportation. Uh, even the food we eat is cultivated using metals. It's brought to market uh, using transportation systems. So zinc, well, it turns out one of the largest zinc deposits is here in Alaska. Zinc's uh, used to galvanize metal to keep it from rusting. It's on the undersides of our cars. It's in the guardrails that keep us safe on the highways. It's used in galvanized nails. Molybdenum, the metal I hadn't even heard of, turns out I've been using it for years. It's a key ingredient of ski wax. Um, perhaps more importantly, it's also used in, as an alloy to make steel much stronger uh, because it has a very, very high heat resistance. But where it really comes home to me is the green economy. Uh, there's a number of examples here of ways that uh, the, the more efficient vehicles and re renewable resources that we want to see more prevalent in, in our nation and the world really rely on minerals and metals for those technologies. A couple of examples, hybrid cars use almost twice as much copper as a regular vehicle. Um, other many examples in solar panels and lithium batteries, wind turbines. I like to tease my environmental friends that they should be advocating for responsible mining because it's those minerals and metals that underpin the technologies that we need to move forward. So if you agree with me that mining is essential to our daily lives, then the next step, of course, is that it must be done in an environmentally sustainable manner and one that respects the health and the safety of the workers and also the people who live in the region. A lot of opponents of mining tend to use examples of mines that were developed, and, and they cite very real problems. Um, but these mines were developed 50 to 100 years ago, long before there was a modern regulatory system, long before there was an environmental movement. If you look at the way things are now, it's, uh, it's quite different. This is a, a selection of the permits that a mine needs to obtain uh, in order to go into operation. The permitting process takes uh, 
at least several years, and it involves dozens of agencies at the federal, state, and local level. Uh, throughout that process, there's opportunity for stakeholder engagement and public comment, and there should be. To my mind, the regulatory process does not need, need to be made less rigorous. It needs to be rigorous, but it also needs to be science-based, transparent, consistent, and efficient. And of course, once you actually bring a mine into operation, it, the regulatory oversight doesn't stop there. It goes all the way through to reclamation and closure. Uh, it's important to know that before a mine ever goes into operation, in Alaska, the reclamation and closure plan has to be approved in advance. And the company has to put up a financial assurance. So if for some reason they are not able to follow through and do that reclamation and closure, the state has access to those finances to, to make sure it's done properly. And that, uh, that assessment and those assurances are actually reviewed on a five-year basis or whenever there's a significant change that uh, requires a review. So mining in Alaska. I'm going to focus on the five metal producing mines because they're really the ones that use a lot of the energy. Um, <clears throat> uh, we do have one uh, coal mine in Alaska. It's a surface coal mine in the interior. Use of Elliott has been operating for many decades. Um, but I'm going to focus on the five metal mines. The top one is Red Dog, which is a uh, surface uh, zinc mine, the largest zinc mine, or one of the largest zinc mines in the world. Uh, it's, it's above the Arctic Circle and it's been in operation since 1989. Next, if you go down the, the list, is Fort Knox. Uh, it's just outside of Fairbanks. It's a surface gold mine. Next is Pogo, a little further outside of Fairbanks. It's an underground gold mine. And then down here in southeast near Juneau, we've got Kensington, uh, our newest underground gold mine, and Greens Creek, which is a polymetallic. It's actually one of the world's top uh, 10 silver producers, but it also produces zinc, lead, and gold. There's also four advanced development projects that I'll mention. Um, the top there is Live and Good, which is a gold deposit. In the, oops, I've lost my laser. Anyways, the top blue circle is Live and Good. Gold deposit in a historic mining district outside of Fairbanks. Um, Donlin Creek is a large gold deposit in western Alaska. Pebble, you may have heard of. It's a very large copper, gold, and molybdenum deposit in southwestern Alaska. And then way down in the bottom right-hand corner is Niblack, uh, which is a polymetallic deposit on Prince of Wales Island, which is near Ketchikan. <clears throat> so, as many of you know, oil and gas drives Alaska's economy, oil and gas and government. Um, but mining, fishing, tourism have a very strong role to play in the economic diversity of this state. Last year, the gross mineral production value for mining was $3 billion, uh, and about half a billion dollars was spent on exploration and development. Mining provides good jobs, year-round jobs, and support, supports local communities and local businesses. Yet, there's only five metal mines, despite the fact that, that a couple of billion dollars have been spent on dozens of exploration projects over the last 30 years, because there's significant challenges to developing a mine in Alaska we're very, very rich in, in resources, um, but we have these, these infrastructure challenges. Of the five metal mines, uh, only two are on what we call the road system, which means they can be driven to, um, and that allows them to also access the power grid. Of course, they're getting power from Fairbanks, which is a pretty high cost power generation area in Alaska. Two of the mines uh, rely entirely on diesel, and one has, is fortunate enough, enough to have access to hydro, although it's intermittent and they have to supplement with diesel. All, of course, use diesel vehicles and diesel equipment. So, of course, it's in the company's interest to find efficiencies. They don't have a choice about the commodity prices. They're very volatile and uh, the, 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 uh, the product um, has to be sold at the, at the global price. They also don't have a whole lot of options with wages and benefits uh, because it's a, it's a competitive industry. So one of the few areas where they can actually reduce operating costs is in energy. However, it's challenging. I'm gonna look a little bit more about what, what kind of energy requirements we're actually talking about here. 
Um, so over the next five slides, I've got each of the five metal mines. I'm not going to read the energy requirements to you. You can see them. I'll just make a couple of points about each one. Uh, one of the interesting things about Red Dog, I mentioned it's actually above the Arctic Circle, and it's on native land. So the native regional corporation in Alaska, in this case NANA, owns the subsurface. They get a royalty from the mine. Um, they also negotiate a very good contract with the operator. 56% of the Red Dog employees are, na are NANA shareholders. Uh, they also have NANA companies that provide contracting services to the mine, camp management, transportation, uh, catering services. NANA's actually grown, since this mine started in 1989, NANA's grown into a global corporation. It has activities all around the world and thousands of employees. And I think in some ways, some of those companies were incubated by their relationship with, with the mine. Fort Knox uh, has the luxury of being close to Fairbanks. It's the only operating mine that's actually near a city, uh, near enough that people can actually, the, the 400 or so employees can actually live in Fairbanks and commute to the mine rather than living on an uh, on-site camp. Um, and they also have access to the power grid. But power generation in Fairbanks is extremely expensive. So to give you an example of just the scale that we're talking about, the Fort Knox gold mine monthly electricity bill is about four million dollars and their diesel bill is almost as much so that kind of blows my mind you know talk about sticker shock when you open up that bill Pogo's uh, uh, one of the more recent mines that started operations in 2006 it's an underground gold mine uh, they built they have a transmission uh, a 50 mile transmission wire that brings their power from the, the Fairbanks grid um, but they've also looked at various efficiencies, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, including using propane. Greens Creek, uh, the underground polymetallic, uh, mostly silver mine, they're the ones that are fortunate to have access to hydro. So up until 2006, they were entirely operating on diesel, but uh, the Juno utility, or the Southeast utility, was able to expand its hydro capacity. And so they have an agreement with Greens Creek that when they have surplus, they provide it to Greens Creek. However, whenever the city of Juneau needs more, uh, more energy, then Greens Creek gets interrupted and has to resort to diesel. So they maintain their 8 to 10 megawatt capacity for those times. A little aside, um, I'm going to talk about new efficiencies, but I want to talk about old efficiencies too. The reason there's hydro in Juneau right now is, is because of the mining industry. Three out of five of the hydroelectric generating plants in Juneau were actually built by the mining